So thank you all for having me here. It's really nice to be here today and uh, take, the, take the trip up from London. I'm traveling around Europe for about seven weeks and it's been a great experience so far of just learning some of the many things that you're doing here that we're not doing in the United States yet, uh, that hopefully we will be catching up to you in many ways. But anyway, so uh, today's talk is called How to Be the Change in a Messed Up World and it's really the idea is to inspire you to make positive changes in your life to make the world a better place, make your communities a better place, make your, make your house, make your work make your life a better place for the earth, your community, and yourself. So some of you might know me for some of my uh, different campaigns. This is the food waste fiasco, so I've dived into about 2,000 dumpsters across the United States and maybe like 20 in the UK only, mostly in the States. And uh, I do the food waste fiasco as a way to uh, show people how much perfectly good food is going to waste. I'll go into these things more in depth, but I'm just kind of giving you a little intro. You might also have seen a, a video of mine, it was called People Are Good, where I landed in Panama, which is the clothes on my back. I was wearing this shirt right here. Uh, I was wearing just the clothes on my back and my passport, so no money, uh, no visas, not even a toothbrush or toothpaste, and I landed there and had to travel back to San Diego, seven countries away, and the idea was to, to uh, put myself out there and, and show the world that people are good, and if you put yourself out there, that people will help. Uh, this turned into a show called Free Ride on Discovery Channel that played here last summer. Uh, I was with an English guy. We didn't always get along. If you ever watch it, you'll see that. <laughs> uh, and then my most, one of my most recent projects was Trash Me. And the idea of this project was to create a visual of how much trash the average Westerner, average American, average English person creates in a month. So. Most of us, we, when we make trash, we throw it in the trash can, and, or rubbish, sorry, rubbish. When we make rubbish, we throw it in the rubbish bin, and then we never have to think about it again. Um, and so we don't realize how much it adds up to. So the average person here makes about two, uh, two kilos of trash per day, about four and a half pounds, which is about 130 pounds or 60 kilos a month. So the idea is just to create a visual to get people thinking about that. And then currently I've been traveling for the last uh, 13 months. Every possession that I own uh, is here in London with me. And uh, the idea is to show how little you need to be happy and healthy. Just keep people thinking about how much stuff we have and whether, whether we need it all. So as, you'll, as you've quickly seen from the last two minutes, I do a lot of very extreme things. And the idea of the extreme things is really to to catch people's attention and get them to stop and think for a moment. We live in a world where you, you're exposed to thousands of advertisements per day, hundreds of Facebook videos, a million ways that you could spend your moment. So it, the extremity is ways to really get people to stop and think and get them to stop and think about important things, sustainability, uh, people, the environment. So a quick disclaimer, I do extreme things, but the point of this isn't for you to go out dumpster diving or flying to a far off place with no money or covering yourself with trash. The idea, the, the whole idea is to inspire you to make small, simple changes in your lifestyle and let it grow from there. And if one day you decide you want to wear your trash, you can, but that's, again, not the point. So um, I have not always been this way. Uh, this is me on the, on the left, not the one drinking the beer, but I was, I'm sure, drinking quite a bit that night as well. And so uh, I'm 30 years old now, and this is when I was about 20, 21-ish. And so for most of my late teens into my early 20s until I was about 25, I was very focused on uh, partying, women, material possessions, money, my car. I shined my car for two hours every single Sunday. I was really focused on those things and I was quite passionate about them. Um, and as you can see, drinking beer out of a plastic cup, I didn't think too much about any of my impact on the earth. I was just, I was just living. Um, so this is uh, another typical night. So this is something that apparently not many people know about. It's called a duck bong. And this is like a beer bong except you cut the uh, foot and the beak off of an ornamental lawn duck and it's hollow and you fill it up with beer and it fits like seven beers in there. Uh, so this is what I was extremely passionate about. Um, and, and 
a good portion of my week, I don't know, maybe a part-time job, say 20 or 30 hours went into women, but I wasn't, when I wasn't successful with women, I found unlucky Christmas trees and things like that. So uh, I was, during this time, I studied biology and chemistry with an aquatic science concentration. So I was always into the environment. But the thing was, I had no connection with how my life was actually a part of the environment. I was completely separate from it. So the gasoline that I was putting in my car, the food that I was eating, the stuff that I was buying at Walmart, which was my go-to store back then, Asda over here. I never thought once about, okay, you know, here I am studying biology and aquatic science and I'm passionate about all animals, but I never thought about how my life actually connects with any of that. And so that's what I was doing, just going about life, making out with Christmas trees and things of that sort. Um, and so in 2011, I moved out to San Diego, California and got away from Wisconsin and I started to watch uh, a handful of documentaries. Some of them were on Netflix, some were just on YouTube. And I started to read books and I just started to really wake up to the serious environmental issues of our time. And I realized that I was actually not, uh, here I thought I was sort of an environmentally minded person because I was recycling and I turned off the water between brushing my teeth and took you know, a little bit shorter showers. So I had thought that I was still doing a pretty good job, but by watching all of these documentaries, I realized that the reality was I was far more a part of the problems in the world than I was in any of the solutions. Most of my daily actions were causing major environmental harm. You know, just every time I needed gas, just pumping it into my car, using plastic bags to go when I was going to Walmart, uh, the food that I was eating that was coming from factory farms, all the trash I was creating. I realized that there was hundreds of ways that I was causing environmental destruction and ultimately social destruction of the li lives of other people around the world. So uh, I, decided, uh, I decided after a little while that I had to change my life because I didn't want to be a complete hypocrite and I wanted to be able to actually feel proud of my life. And at that point, I no longer was. So at that point, I just started to, I could have felt this doom and gloom like, what can I possibly do? I'm causing all of this destruction and, you know, it's too late. I've, this is the way my life is. So I could have felt that way and I could have felt like there was nothing that I could do. But instead, what I decided is that I was just going to start making small changes in my life. And so what I did is I made a long list and I hung it up uh, in a prominent place in my kitchen, right on the wall. And then I, I taped a pen with a string next to that. And then my goal was just to make one change a week, at least. Knowing that two years of doing that would be 104 changes, which is quite a few. So I made that list and I just started to do small things. So one of the first ones was getting a reusable shopping bag and not getting my plastic bags anymore. That was a simple type thing. Some of the changes took a little bit more work. Like one of my goals was to, to uh, drive way less and have a bike. So it took work to, to do that. I had to get into better shape and things like that. So some of the initial changes, one of the big ones was just shopping local. So going to the farmer's market instead of going to Walmart, supporting local businesses like the hardware store instead of going to Home Depot and Lowe's. I don't know what you have over here. What do you have over here that's like that? What is it? B and Q? Huh. I don't always understand the English. It's kind of funny. <laughs> it's the same language, but... Um, so, uh, and then another big thing was just changing the food I was eating. I was eating... Growing up in Wisconsin, it is the dairy state, so I was having milk for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks in between, and I was eating meat at most every meal, and so eating a, a lot, just eating a lot more fruits and vegetables, a more plant-based diet, eating more... Uh, more things that were actually food, so unpackaged, unprocessed stuff. So I started to look at the ingredients list and just realize like, man, half these ingredients are not even food. Why are these, why are these in there? So just starting to eat more whole foods. This photo, for example, just shows I bought a lot of food uh, in bulk at the grocery store, uh, unpackaged, like I'm holding popcorn there and just popping my own popcorn instead of getting the one that is covered in who knows what. Um, and then another big change for me was when I really started to think about all the different things that I was told that my body needed. So I, I went through my closet and I had like 20 or 30 different things. I had 
shampoo, conditioner, different soaps, face wash, body wash, deodorant, you know, Listerine, uh, all these things. And I just started to think about, you know, <coughs> do I really need these things just to exist? And so a lot of it was thinking about where am I spending my money? And ultimately, you know, the, the saying time is money, if, if that applied in that scenario, then what am I working for? I'm working to to rub these oils and lotions and whatever on my body and all the ways that I was just blowing my money when I, what I really wanted to do is to start to live a more purposeful and passionate life. So another big change was just getting rid of all of those things that I didn't need and the ones that I did need finding alternatives where I wasn't flushing lots of chemicals down the drain, getting rid of things like bleach and things like that. So over a period of about two years, I continued to just make positive changes in my life, and I found that the more that I was doing to live a more environmentally friendly life, that actually the healthier I became too, eating healthier, being on the bike instead of driving a car. And so it just, uh, I became you know, more excited about it and more and more excited to make positive changes. And ultimately, I wanted to share this with people because a lot of the times, the way society is constructed we don't have that many opportunities to think about environmental type things. It's just, there's much more opportunities to get at that for ads to buy things and stuff like that. So I wanted to really, you know, get to share this with people. So uh, I decided to bike across the United States on a uh, bamboo bicycle. So it was San Francisco to Vermont. It was 4,700 miles. And the idea was to take all of the things when it comes to sustainable living and wrap it up into an adventure that would be fun and interesting to, to watch, but also for me a challenge and exciting. So the idea was that uh, I was going to try to cycle across the country without having any environmental impact, so causing no destruction, which I learned is basically nearly impossible, but I did at least uh, drastically reduce it. So I set rules for myself for the five key aspects of sustainable living, the things that we deal with on a daily basis, that's food, water, energy, waste, and transportation. So those are the things that we pretty much deal with every day, no matter what. So food we have to eat, water we have to drink, transportation, most of us, I mean, occasionally we stay in the house for 24 hours, but typically transportation, waste, we're always creating that, uh, and then energy, electricity. So the things that we deal with on a daily basis. So for food, the rule was I could only eat local, organic, unpackaged food for the entire summer. So couldn't have gone to almost any grocery store because it had to, the food had to come from within the state that I was in. By organic, I just mean natural. It didn't have to be certified or anything. And then unpackaged, so n no, no trash being created. Um, and so I found that to be pretty hard. And that was the first time that I ever went dumpster diving. So this is early 2013. I still had a uh, pretty solid ego and still worried quite a bit what people were thinking about me. So, you know, when I was going to look into a dumpster for the first time, I really quietly snuck around back and like peered inside and make sure no one could see me. And I was, I was amazed at just looking inside how much perfectly good food was in there. So on that trip, I just continued looking in the dumpsters and found that dumpster after dumpster after dumpster was filled to the brim with perfectly good food. Uh, we have these, uh, these, what do you call these? Easy peelers? Or clementines? What do you call these here in England? Huh? Satsumas, okay. So you have one bad one in here. So I'll rip this open. But this, this whole batch of about, what, 10 of these has one bad one. And here's the bad one. And so what happens is they throw away the whole bag when they could have just gotten rid of this one bad one. So this is what you're seeing in the dumpsters. It's not nasty food, as you can see. It's one bad one, and, and you take that out, and then you've got 10 or so good ones. Or you'd find also bananas like this. You know, they're slightly brown, but they have a new shipment of green ones in, and if they don't get rid of the old ones, then they're going to have too many. So you'll find things like that. So um, the next thing was... Uh, water. So for the entire bike ride, I couldn't use any water that came from on the grid. So couldn't turn on a shower, couldn't turn on a faucet, use a flush toilet, uh, use a washing machine, any of the ways that we use water on a daily basis. 
I could get it from natural bodies of water, so lakes and rivers and wells, or the exception was I could also use wasted water. So this is a fire hydrant in Brooklyn that I lived off of for five days. You can see a leak uh, down here, right there. And um, so this one fire hydrant alone was wasting 770 gallons, or about 3,000 liters of water per day. And so this was where for five days I bathed in it. As you can see, I am wearing shorts, swim shorts, just so you know, um, and brushed my teeth, you know, used it for cooking, all of that. Um, and then for energy, the rule was I couldn't use any electricity that I didn't create or that I didn't create from my own portable solar panels. So imagine on any day not being able to use electricity. So think simple things like using the refrigerator or, or turning on a light switch or using an escalator or an elevator. But then what happened was since I was diving so deep into all these things, I just started to realize all the ways we use electricity. So pushing the button to cross the street uh, at a stoplight was something that I couldn't do. Or um, one of the big challenges was when I was riding my bike through a neighborhood and an automatic light would go on, I'd have to go over there and unscrew the bulb if I could so that it would go off. Uh, or, but then the thing is, the more that I really started to strip my life back to the basics, the more I really started to understand my life and my impact on the earth. So one of the big things, you know, my, my, I had a cell phone and I had a computer that I was using for blogging and they were powered by solar, but I, and I always knew, my exception was that I could log on to, uh, to Wi-Fi, which I knew would mean I was using some electricity from the router. But at this time, something I didn't realize was, you know, everyone knows the saying, the cloud, you know, where your stuff's being stored. And what that means is it's just being stored on someone else's computer. And so what I learned is that all of these, all, every time I upload something online, say a picture onto Facebook, that's being stored on a computer which is taking electricity. So I learned that every moment of my life, whether I'm asleep or I'm awake, I'm consuming electricity. Um, so for, for waste, I could only use, all right, sorry, every piece of trash that I created, I had to carry across the country with me. So if I had um, a, you know, a candy bar today, it would have gone all the way across the country with me. So in that summer, I created 104 pounds of trash, or sorry, two pounds of trash in 104 days. So that's what the average person creates by about one o'clock in the afternoon on any given day. And then lastly, for transportation, I could only uh, ride my bike or walk. So not even public transportation or anything like that. And I really learned on this trip the power of a bicycle. Because I met people that were 60 or 70 years old cycling across the country. I met 10-year-olds that biked to school and back. I met people that were really large that were biking across the country. And so I really was amazed at how far a bike can take you. And so this trip, by stripping my life back to the basics for 104 days, it really, it really just helped me to understand my existence on Earth and how it impacts everything around me. So I continued on for another, I got back to San Diego, I lived in an apartment at the time, and I continued living in that apartment, and I still continued making changes. One of the big ones, after this trip that I realized was all of my money was in Chase Bank. So one of the you know, large banks, and I realized that they're using that money to invest in the very things that I'm trying to avoid uh, in a lot of fossil fuel projects and things like that. So one of the big steps was taking my money out of the bank and switching to a local credit union. Same with my credit cards. Um, I also got rid of my trash can in the house by having used what I learned on the bike trip to create less trash. So I continued making changes, and I lived in the apartment. And then I decided uh, that I wanted to really take this extreme sustainable living to the city and show people how you can do everything in, in sort of an extreme way. So I came up with uh, deciding to live in a little tiny house. So it was New Year's Day, 2015. I woke up and I went on Craigslist to look for a van because I wanted to build a tiny house and I was going to live in a van next to it while I was building it. And I found this online for $950. So that's what, like 700 pounds or something like that. And I thought it must have been a typo. I thought it must have been $9,500. 
so I, but I put the $950 in my pocket and I went up there, I rode my bike up there and uh, I realized why it was only $950 because it's basically a, a shed on wheels, but not even a good shed, just like a little wooden box on wheels. But I bought it and I couldn't quite stand in it. It's five feet wide, it was five by 10. So I'm like six, I'm five ten. So it was like maybe about like that and then 10 feet. So maybe from here to the first seat. So I think the, a lot of your bathrooms might be bigger than it. So it's pretty small. But as I said in the beginning, I do extreme things to get people really thinking. So in the last couple of decades, house sizes have doubled. In the States, it's gone from 1,500 square feet to about 3,000 square feet. So house sizes have doubled, but we're at a time when actually happiness and health is, is actually on a decline. So getting people to think about uh, those sorts of things. So I did the same with food, water, energy, waste, transportation. So here I grew some of my own food. Uh, San Diego is a desert, so it's, it's, it gets very minimal rain, so it's not the easiest place to do that since I was living completely off the grid and only using rainwater. But I managed to grow some of my own food. The food that I didn't grow came from the local farmer's market. And then for water, I harvested all of my rainwater one of the things that I've realized about sustainability, uh, living a more environmentally friendly life, is it's, it's usually more about a matter of perspective and psychology than any actual concrete reality. So to give you an example, the average American uses 80 to 100 gallons of water per day. The average uh, European, about 50 gallons of water per day. And the average African, so sub-Saharan Africa, which is 50 of the 54 countries, the average person uses two to five gallons of water per day. So I was using two to five gallons of water per day, the same amount as the average person in Africa. A lot of people would think it's, it's very extreme to use that little water, but it's only a matter of perspective, because if you go to someone who's using two to five gallons of water per day, and they saw you running the faucet while you're brushing your teeth, they would think that's extreme. To go to Africa and see people having to carry their two gallons of water that would look extreme. So what I've learned is that everything is, everything is a matter of perspective, and when you change your perspective, you can totally change everything in your life. So for me, I was able to, uh, so San Diego is, as I said, a desert, and a lot of you have probably seen on national media that it's actually in a mega drought. So that has receded a little bit, but during this time it was in a mega drought. So people would have thought it would be totally impossible to live only on rainwater, but even in San Diego, a house of the average, the average roof space is 1,500 square feet. That's enough to collect 10,000 gallons, so 40 liters of water per year. So I was able to, uh, to have plenty of water to do so. Um, for energy, one of the, the other things that I've really learned is a lot of people, there's a, there's a stigma that sustainable living is only for the wealthy. You have to have a lot of money to be able to live sustainably, and I've learned that that also is a matter of perspective. So to give you an example with the solar panels, if you have an, a very more intricate life and you have two refrigerators and you have a flat screen TV and you have like 10 different kitchen appliances and a hair dryer and all of that stuff, then you're going to need a much larger solar system and then maybe it is more for people who have more money. But for me, for example, these were all the solar panels I needed. So rather than it being a $15,000 system, it was, say, a $700 system. So by reducing my needs, uh, that's what made it actually possible for me to do this without having a lot of money to be able to do it. Uh, and then this is kind of the holy grail for me of the years of sustainable living, and that's pooping in a five-gallon bucket. You would uh, not believe how excited I was when I finally achieved pooping in a five-gallon bucket. And so the reason why is I've learned that anytime we do something that's really easy, what that means is that the burden is being placed elsewhere. So for example, one of the simplest ways to put it is when you're driving a car, you know, imagine this is your ankle, you go from this to this, and now you're going 60 miles per hour when you were dead still. It takes almost no work versus riding a bike takes a lot of work to bike 60 miles versus driving. So the work is, it's coming from the calories from your body. It's coming from the energy you're expending yourself. So why is it easy to drive a car? That's because all of the 
burden, the work is being placed elsewhere. And so when that, when that happens, what that usually means is there's externalized costs. So for example, there's 10,000 oil spills per year. That's part of uh, why it's so easy to drive a car. Or the thousands of people that are working on the oil rigs, uh, the methane emissions and the CO2 emissions and things like that. So I learned every time something's really easy, I should stop and think, why is this easy? Who's paying for this to be easy? A lot of the times it's people working really low income in, in horrible uh, conditions in factories. They're the ones that are taking my burden. And so back to the poop, which is my favorite part of the whole uh, talk. Um, the thing is, when we f the easiest thing to do is flush a toilet. Ex you know, occasionally it gets stopped up and you have to deal with it. But flushing a toilet is a very easy thing to do. So where's the burden being placed? So the average toilet uses 1.6 gallons, or that would be about seven liters per flush. So if the average person in Africa is using two to five gallons per day, that means just one toilet flush could be the amount of water that they have for a whole day, or maybe two or three flushes. So in this case, the burden is going to, uh, a lot of the times, water pollution. It's going to all the chemicals that are needed to purify it, so the chlorine and things like that. Uh, it's going to all the infrastructure that's constantly needing to be repaired and things like that. Versus with a compost toilet, I didn't have to have anyone else doing my work for me. So instead it, was go into, it would go into a compost pile. And then the thing that's nice about composting, a lot of people think it can be pretty complicated, but composting is just what the earth does. It's what it's been doing for millions and millions, billions of years, and it's why we exist. Because the earth naturally is able to break things down. So simply a compost, pie, a compost bin can literally just be a pile of earth matter, and it will turn into soil. So in this scenario, um, a lot of, and a lot, the other thing is a lot of people would worry about it. They would think it might be dangerous. So all of the, the pathogens in our body, bacteria, viruses, and things like that, they're all designed to live at our body temperature about. So that's why when you get a flu, for example, you heat up because it's trying to kill what's, uh, what's making you sick. So the thing about a compost pile is that all the microbes uh, so the macroorganisms, which we, we bugs, worms and beetles and things like that, and then the microorganisms like the bacteria, one of the byproducts of is heat. One of the things that they make when they're eating stuff is heat. So a compost bile can heat up to about 160 degrees, and so viruses are designed to live at, say, 100. This is all in Fahrenheit. Um, so, they, so within three days, all of that's killed. Another one of the lessons that I've that I learned is that, so on my YouTube channel and my Facebook page, I would constantly get, when I would talk about this stuff, I'd constantly get uh, messages or, or comments like, ew, this guy's eating food from his own poop and things like that. And I didn't have the best response until I, because I just was like, yeah, I guess they're probably right. They probably don't eat food that's grown with poop. Well, I know cow manure, but probably not human manure. So, I didn't know what to say fully, but then I just read a book uh, when I was doing Trash Me, and I learned that, so New York City, for example, which is pretty similar to London in size, I think it's about eight million people. What happens with the poop there is it's, it comes into uh, the central system, and then it's broken down somewhat, but there's something called sludge. So there's something that's called sludge, and then to my surprise, what happens is that sludge is turned into a fertilizer, but what is included in that sludge is all of the chemicals that go down the drain with it. So you have your pharmaceuticals and you have your heavy metals and things like that, but then you also have the things like uh, a car shop deciding to flush their, uh, their oils, oil changes down or dump it in the drain. So now what you have is a toxic slurry of poop. And then that is shipped to places like Texas and Florida where it's used to grow the food that people are buying at the grocery store. So I was relieved to know that I was eating what was pretty clean poop. Well, I wasn't eating the poop, but eating stuff that was grown off relatively clean poop of my own versus thousands of other people's toxic slurry poop. Again, uh, every, it's, it's about just waking up to and thinking about our lives. Um, and so at the tiny house, I. Uh, created this much trash usually in about two to four weeks, so it was more than when I was on the bike ride, but it was about a couple of pounds per month. And then so for transportation, uh, we have something called 
car to go which is an electric car share program and so uh, when I got rid of my car that was actually one of the the nicest things I ever did for living where I can actually wake up in the morning and do what I want to do so the average person in the United States spends seven thousand to nine thousand dollars per year on their vehicle and I would imagine it's similar over here so what that means is that the average American is working January and February of every single year just to pay for their vehicle. So imagine if January and February you could do something awesome instead of owning a car for, for the entire year. So that's why I got rid of my car. And the, what made it easier was using a public uh, a, a car share program. So how this one works is you have a little card. You touch it up to the window, you get in, type in your passcode, and then you get to drive, and then you leave it. When you're done, you get to leave it in a parking spot. So there's, there are car share programs, I know. Is there any in Luton? I know there's some in London, like Zipcar or things like that. But, um, and then I rode my bike as well. So a uh, couple of a couple other things. Um, so back to the food waste fiasco. So I try to focus on a lot of different environmental issues uh, and not get like too pigeonholed into one area. But the more over the last five years that I've learned about food waste, the more I've realized that it's actually one of the most pressing environmental and social issues of our time. There's a really great TED talk called The Global Food Waste Scandal, which is by Tristram Stewart, uh, who lives here in London. And uh, it, I've just realized that, well, the reason that it's one of the most pressing issues of our time is uh, it's very easy to look at, say, this banana and just say, you know, when you waste a banana, you're, you know, you're just wasting the banana. But what it is, is that everything that goes into using, into producing this banana is wasted as well. So this banana came from Colombia. So you have uh, all of the transportation, the fossil fuels that went into it. You also have the fossil fuels that go into producing it. You also have all of the water that goes into growing it. You have the land space. So Colombia is a place that has a lot of rainforest deforestation. So you have deforestation happening to ultimately waste a banana. We waste one third of our food globally, which means we waste one third of our land space that could instead be uh, wild space. But we also waste all of the human energy too. So a lot of our strawberries, if you get the strawberries here in the winter, a lot of them are sprayed with pesticides. You have people working $5 a day and those people have often four times higher rates of cancer from spraying with pesticides and, and uh, inhaling that. So you're also wasting the human life and the human potential. So for me, I w with the whole idea of the food waste fiasco is how can I really show people how much food we're wasting and help people to understand it. So uh, we live in a, in a very visual world and so I can, you know, we can rattle off numbers all day, for example, the amount of food wasted just in the United States is $165 billion, which is more than the budgets for every single national park, public library, veterans health care, the federal prisons, the FBI, and the FDA combined. So it's a massive number. But a lot of people just need to see a visual to be able to understand it. So that's, that's what the food waste fiasco is for. And so one of the f one of the when I first started dumpster diving, I said I was really timid about it. There was this girl, her name is Cheryl, and I was very much in love with her at that time. This was in 2013, and I told her what I was seeing, how much food was being wasted. She told me, don't tell anybody you're dumpster diving because everybody's just going to think you're crazy. Maybe I'll think you're crazy. I don't and uh, so she, she strongly recommended that I didn't do it, which I kind of agreed with at the time. Um, and so here we are, this is three years later, and she's my girlfriend now, so it turned out she didn't think I was too crazy. And the big thing that I got from this, the years of transitioning to a more environmentally friendly life where I was thinking about more than myself, I found that actually the more that I stood up for what I believed and the more I was passionate and purposeful about things, the more people actually did like me rather than decided that they didn't like me. So I learned that you can eat trash and still have your girlfriend too, however that saying goes. <laughs> um, and then my most recent project was called Trash Me. So this was inspired in part by Morgan Spurlock's uh, Super Size Me. Have you seen that where he ate McDonald's for 30 days, nothing but? So I wanted to figure out how can I get people thinking about trash in a way that he was able to get people thinking about 
how much McDonald's sucks. So how can I get people to associate trash in that sort of similar way? So like I said, when we, when we put our garbage in the garbage cans, we rarely ever think about where's it really go, and we never really think about how much it adds up to. And so it's actually a much larger problem than we would ever imagine. So uh, we have something called EPA Superfund sites in the United States, which are the most toxic places. These are the places where they have to spend millions of dollars to clean up. Uh, oil spills could be a Superfund site and things like that. Well, it turns out one in every four Superfund sites is a landfill. So they cause a lot. So what happens is they have um, liquids that come out the bottom, seepage of sorts, and that's really toxic and can come into our groundwaters. And then you have methane coming out. So they're pretty, they end up being pretty toxic places. So, uh, you know, the idea that trash is out of sight, out of mind is catching up to us uh, in 2017. And we're realizing that once it's out of sight, actually it still has to be in mind. So the idea was to create visuals that really would just uh, get people thinking about it. You know, for what I was doing was just living the average American life. So went to Starbucks to get my coffee, went to the grocery store and bought all my packaged stuff. And the only exception is that I had to wear every single piece of it. So I created 87 pounds of trash during that month, which is about one third less than what the average American or, or uh, Brit would make. Um, and so again, the whole idea of all of these things is that they are pretty extreme, but they're really just a fun way and interesting way to get people thinking about all these things. And again, it all comes down to, you know, what things can we do at home, at work, at school, to live in a way that's more beneficial to the earth as a whole, to our communities that we live in, and ourselves, to be happier and healthier. So these are some of the things that, that we can all do. Uh, so for f I broke these down into food, water, energy, waste, and transportation. So for food, um, one of the simple ones is to try to eat as local as possible, buying, so here buying food that's from Britain uh, rather than from the United States or Chile or New Zealand or things like that. Uh, eating as much organic or natural foods as possible, so maybe knowing the farmer where food comes from. Uh, unpackaged, so trying, you know, the way that I looked at this was, I used to buy potato chips quite a bit and they come in a little bag and it takes me about, it would take me about five minutes to eat a bag of potato chips doesn't even really provide much nutritional value. So basically for five minutes of enjoyment, that plastic bag would be created and that plastic bag would be here when, if, when our kids, 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 kids are on earth. So that plastic bag just for five minutes of enjoyment. So that's what I think about when I think about packaged food now. Uh, whole foods, so uh, not the grocery store, but just a whole food is just a perfect example. So an apple rather than applesauce, you know, something that's whole and one ingredient. Uh, growing your own food is one of the greatest ways to connect with your food, even if it's just, uh, even if it's just one tomato plant or on your balcony just having some herbs, really just helps you think, it just makes you think about food differently when you actually see it go from seed into something that you can eat. Uh, eating seasonal, so food that is growing that season, which goes pretty hand in hand with local because most local places can't produce stuff that isn't seasonal. A big, really nice one, nice simple thing we can do is eat our food. So even as individuals, we waste about 25% of our food. So if we go to the grocery store and buy four bags of food, we throw away one on average. So one of the nicest ways uh, is just to eat our food instead of throwing it away. And then another a really big one is eating a lot more fruits and vegetables and less animal products. So that one really should be on the top because it's the one that has the most environmental impact. So to give you an example, a hamburger, one hamburger uses about 660 gallons or 3,000 liters of water to produce just one sim single hamburger, um, which is the same with, so same with water. So all of these things below, like for example, I did a, uh, when I did the bike ride across the country, I wasn't taking showers and that turned into a year without showering. So imagine going an entire year without showering, how much water you'd conserve, and that's the equivalent to six hamburgers. So all of these things down here matter, but they're minuscule compared to the food that we're eating. That's where, that's where so much of our water consumption actually is. So other things are, 
there's a saying, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. So flush in the toilet less. Taking shorter showers each minute off the shower is about two gallons or eight liters of water. Uh, growing food, not lawn. So that's a, that's a pretty fun one. Instead of growing something that serves minimal purpose, growing something that's beautiful and you get to eat. Uh, harvesting rainwater, so you're blessed with plenty of rain here, and that can be just as simple as putting buckets under your gutters, or you can do something a little more advanced and actually rig you know, the, the downspout into some big tanks, so pretty simple. Uh, and then you can use that for watering your garden, growing food. Um, installing efficient faucets, that's a really easy one on your, you call them, it's a tap here, right? Yeah. So you can, you can screw the thing on the tap off. There's a little faucet head, and you can, in three minutes, take that off. It costs about $3 and put one on that uses four times less water. Uh, planting things that grow natively that need less work, and then gray water. So gray water is basically water that, uh, from your sink or your shower, things like that, or from your laundry. There's something called laundry to landscape where you can plant fruit trees outside and rig it up so your laundry water goes straight to the fruit trays. You use a biodegradable soap, and then every time you do laundry, you're actually watering your fruit trees and growing yourself some apples. Uh, so for energy, using less heating and air conditioning is a simple one, so layering up or taking off layers. Turning things off, uh, unplugging things. So one of the things that I, you know, this is kind of one of those details that you start to realize is there's something called a phantom pull. So when things are plugged in, even when they're off, they can be pulling electricity out of the wall. So simply unplugging things. Switching to uh, CFL or LED bulbs. Oh, it's so bright. Is that, what is that? CFL? Can't tell. So an LED bulb uses 10 times less electricity than an incandescent bulb. So the sa if the saying, uh, a penny saved is a penny earned, then your bulbs are paying you, uh, usually within a couple of months or, or a year of switching them out. Washing clothes less uh, and hang drying. It seems like a lot of people hang dry in, in the, so far in, in Europe. It's not really a popular thing in the States. Uh, finding an electricity-free alternative. So just like, for example, if you're making uh, orange juice, there's hand-pressed ones rather than electric ones. Uh, and the nice thing about all of these things is that they are better for the environment, but really most of them also save you a lot of money. Rather than things that actually cost you money, all of these things pretty much save you money, and they generally make you healthier and happier too, rather than being like a burden. They often end up making you feel better. Uh, and then another one is just nature. The more time you spend in nature, the more you're not using electricity. You're just out in nature. Uh, and then so for waste, you've probably all heard of the three R's. I didn't know in the past that the R's actually go in that order. So it's for a reason, it's reduce, reuse, recycle. But what that means is first reduce, then reuse, and lastly recycle. So if you're practicing zero waste, the goal isn't to recycle more, it's actually to recycle less. So the five R's are refuse. So when you don't need something, just saying, no, thank you, I don't need that, like a flyer on the street. So refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle. There's other R's as well, but those are just the ones that I put in the five R's. Uh, carrying a, so some of those, carrying a reusable water bottle, one of the simplest ones. Bottled water can be 1,000 to 2,000 times more expensive. So imagine going and getting a $5 sandwich and paying $5,000 for that sandwich instead. That's bottled water. Um, saying no to disposable items. So anytime that you're gonna get something that would be used once and then thrown away, having an alternative. Uh, for example, care, bringing your own plate to a place that uses styrofoam plates or something like that. Uh, buying unpackaged food, buying used stuff as much as you can. I think there's Freegal and FreeCycle here. Um, and what's that other one? Anyone know the Gumtree? and gum trees, so there's all sorts of places to get used stuff, thrift stores as well, repairing things, so for example, sewing your clothes rather than just throwing them out. Uh, donating things when you're done with them to a thrift store or something like that. Uh, buying quality things that last, so if you're gonna buy a toaster, buy one that's designed to last a lifetime, not one year and throwing it out. Uh, and composting, and then lastly, transportation. 
Some of the ones are uh, living car free, if that suits you. If not, then you can join a car share program. You can simply drive less. If you, uh, one of the great things with riding a bike is getting a bike rack. Um, that really, uh, it's amazing when you have a bike rack, what you can accomplish. For example, going to the grocery store with a bike rack, uh, you can fit about two, two full grocery bags, like the, the paper ones in there. So you can do most of your errands on a bike uh, using public transportation, which I know the public transportation is not the most amazing, but you should see the United States and you'd be pretty happy. Uh, and then simply living near the places you are. Less commuting time means more time doing what you want to be doing. And then walking. And then lastly, another, another one is supporting environmental nonprofits. So uh, a lot of nonprofits are out there doing these very things that we want to do. Maybe sometimes it's hard for us to be able to do certain ones, so you can support nonprofits that are able to do that. One way is by volunteering. A really great nonprofit here is called Feedback, and they do volunteer days where you go to farms and collect all the food that would have gone to waste. So they collect like thousands of pounds of potatoes at a time or things like that, and then it goes to people uh, who don't always have enough food. So volunteering with nonprofits or uh, donating to nonprofits. And a really cool way to do that, there's something called 1% for the Planet, and that's a network where you can join, and uh, how it works is you donate 1% to a nonprofit of your choice, and then they just certify it. So if you make 10,000 pounds in a year, you'd be donating $100. If you'd make 100,000, it'd be 1,000. So it's just a way to be able to uh, support nonprofits. The statistic is that of all philanthropy, only 3% goes into the environment. So supporting those nonprofits makes a huge difference. So, uh, so we have time for questions still, right? Any people that need to duck out, do so now. And then anyone that has questions, please ra raise your hand and I will get the mic to you. Um, if we have any questions. I'll put that up there. Yeah, okay, we're going to Emma. Hello. Hi. Um, just a, a quick question as to whether you ever have any conflict um, and how you resolve it in terms of, so as an example, um, I've got a local butcher's near me, but the meat isn't organic or ethically farmed. So do I buy local or do I find somewhere that's mm. organic and ethical? So do you ever have similar conflicts and, and how do you decide how to resolve those? So um, one of the things that I've learned is that there is no such thing as black and white, really in the world at all, but definitely in caring about the earth. Everything is on a shade of gray. So for example, you have eat organic, and you also have eat unpackaged, but most organic stuff is packaged. So really it, it comes down to just doing as, as good you, as you can, and none of us are ever going to be perfect. I flew here from the United States, causes huge environmental destruction. So it's about just thinking deeply about what we're doing and trying to make the best choices we as we can. You'll find that if you care about the world, that you're going to be a hypocrite no matter what. You're, it's just impossible to care and not be a hypocrite. So the idea, in my mind, is to reduce our hypocrisy as much as possible, understand and embrace our hypocrisy, and uh, just try to do as best as we can. Yeah. Any other questions? Please don't be shy. I'm sure you have loads. Yeah, you can ask any question you, you want. You. I'm not, uh, this is an opportunity. I have lived like 99.9% .9 transparent. So if it's about money, if it's about going to the bathroom, if it's about anything you want. Uh, just a quick point. You seem to love poop. So um, <laughs> water in the UK is recycled mm. through the same network as our toilet. So actually you could drink the water from your toilet because it's the same water that comes with your tap, so you could use that one. But um, what is the hardest change that you had to make but you probably thought might be the biggest impact or mm. made a difference? What's the hardest, uh, the, the hardest change, did you say? Um, well, I will say that the change that, I, that is the hardest is flying, actually, because most everything you can change to do it in a way that's more environmentally friendly. E when it, and it doesn't mess up your life. Eating healthier doesn't mess up your life. It makes it better. You know, you, there's using public transportation or riding a bike more. It doesn't mean that you can't still go to concerts and things like that. Whereas flying is one where there's not like an easy difference. If I wanted to come to Europe, I have to take like a two-week boat 
across. And you can just only do so much when you're spending two weeks on a boat if you want to go somewhere. So that's actually been the most challenging one. And for me, it's about, for example, I won't go back to just fly to see my mom anymore. If I want to see my mom, then I got to organize an environmental campaign in my mom's town to make it actually worth it, you know, so that I can so that I can do something worthwhile that, well, of course seeing my mom is really worthwhile, but you get what I'm saying. So that's, that's really been the hard one is, is flying. And, and it's about the water thing, I should have mentioned that. You have so much water here in the UK that it makes sense, like why would you conserve it? So running uh, the water for five minutes is the equivalency of running a 60 watt bulb for 22 hours. So when we use water, we use all the electricity, but also all the chemicals that are used to, to purify it both before it reaches us and then afterwards. So that's actually one of the more impactful parts of water. Great, one last question because we're almost at half 12. Thank you. Oh, two, we'll take two more, we'll take two more. Okay. That's it. Uh, earlier on you said um, that, that by taking a car out of your life, you, had, you gave back your sort of January and February in terms of your salary. In terms of all of the changes that you've made, have you ever calculated how much further into the year you didn't need to work as mm. a result? Well, I don't work anymore, so 12 months, I guess. <laughs> um, I just find that, like, the, you know, for me, I am working, obviously, like, this is work, but I find that when you're really passionate about something you're doing, you're, there is no separation between work and life because you just really like it. So I'm still working, but, but not for money, you know, instead for things that are more important. So what's your next adv adventure? So, all of you love traveling. I've got a great opportunity for you. May 29th, we're biking from New York City to Seattle, Washington. It's 82 days. Fits right in with your 90-day visa. And uh, we're going to be planting <laughs> gardens across the United States. So, so far there's about 50, 40, 50 people that are doing the ride. And there's a couple of Brits I know that are, that are a part of it. Um, and so you can join for the whole ride or you can join for part of the ride and we're just, yeah, it's called uh, Green Riders, Good Deeds on Bikes. So we're just biking across the country doing good deeds for people that are good for someone and good for the earth as well. Like for example, planting a garden in an older person's uh, yard so they can have their own food and not have to go to the grocery store and stuff like that. And then next year I'm doing a project where for one year I'm going to grow, forage, or hunt every single thing that I eat for, for an entire year. And that'll be in Florida, probably in the Orlando area. So if you're in that area, I'm going to be hosting workshops uh, on, on growing food and things like that. So if you're in Orlando, 2018, that's where I'll be. And you can come visit then at the, um, at the uh, little homestead and workshop area. So uh, if you want to follow Krista put these nice things up on there. I never have done that before, but uh, I'm not actually very active on, Insta on Twitter. Is that what that sign is, Twitter? So you can follow me on there, but not, I don't do too much. Facebook Lo is Lots on YouTube, though. Y YouTube, Facebook, and uh, my website, which is just robgreenfield.tv. So thanks, f everyone, for coming out. We're going to lunch, right? Yes, yes. So um, we actually are taking Rob upstairs to the canteen. And if anyone wants to join, you're welcome to do so. If you have any more questions and you are a bit shy. Um, and obviously, uh, please follow Rob on these channels and also join our Tui Better World uh, group because there's a lot more that, um, that we will be doing that we'd like you to be part of and, and participate in. So please, please, please give uh, Rob a big uh, round of applause and thank him for, for coming here today. Thank you.